uh, shared uh, our presentation into two parts. Huh? Uh, I will start um, with mostly uh, what we have done uh, in the last years, uh, mostly on individual hazards, shallow landslides, uh, uh, debris flows and also then uh, a regional scale uh, early warning about uh, yeah some types of landslides and flood hazards. And the second part will uh, will present uh, Bastian more perhaps on multi hazard. Uh, uh, he will explain in more detail what what uh, he will do. Okay, so let's uh, yeah for me only very short uh, presentation. I I'm. Uh, uh, an earth scientist from ETH in Zurich. Uh, I did my uh, final thesis, uh, uh, master thesis on debris flows in the in the Swiss Alps, and then uh, uh, I jumped uh, uh, to Barcelona. I jumped also a little bit uh, uh, about uh, uh, the topic of landslides, were more volcanic landslides, and uh, I worked in Canary Islands. Did my PhD in 1990, 19, and then. Uh, uh, I was a postdoc and returned to Barcelona in 2001, and since then I am more related to rainfall-induced landslides, uh, hazard, uh, risk uh, assessment, etc. Okay, so to start a little bit, what uh, what we are doing normally huh? when we uh, make modeling and uh, also mitigation, we start always uh, with monitoring. Huh? We, at the end, I, I insist always that we need data. Without data, we are not able to um, to have good models. Uh, not even we are, we are able to understand the process. Huh? First, we have to understand and analyze the data. And, uh, and thus improve the, the understanding of the process. Eh? Without of that, we are not able to develop models. Eh? This, uh, for me, is basic. So we, uh, our uh, first part is always we need data and good data, eh? and then we can uh, develop the model, and then we make uh, uh, mitigation. We also develop warning systems, and uh, we make assessment for future changes, and a uh, little bit of this parts in red, uh, I will uh, show you during the, this presentation. OK, so uh, let's start uh, Catalonia. Uh, most of you know uh, where we are and now northeast of the Iberian uh, Peninsula. We are between uh, Mediterranean and the Pyrenees, as we can see here. We are in Barcelona, uh, UPC, and uh, yeah, we have uh, uh, local scale data and local scale analysis with a full scale physical experiment. Uh, we have monitoring at several places in the Pyrenees and pre Pyrenees. And then we have the, the data from uh, inventories eh? uh, at a uh, regional scale. And at the end, we want also to apply everything to the whole Catalonia, more or less 32,000 uh, square kilometers to have an idea about the study area. OK, so now I would start uh, our approach from shallow landslides uh, from local to regional scale, huh? what we are doing. Huh? Let's go uh, now to the, this site in the pre -Pyrenees. It's a shallow landslide that we have monitored uh, since uh, many years without going into details. These are different uh, volumetric water content sensors at different depths. Huh? Uh, the, the, the black one is measured uh, with the, the, the rainfall, the daily rainfall over with the time. And then we use uh, our models. This is a very sophisticated geotechnical model, thermo hydromechanical uh, uh, ele finite element model that we can use in 1D or 2D to uh, check our, our data. Huh? OK, so this is uh, one. Uh, model that we use. It's for local scale, huh? uh, shallow landslides, and we also use it to develop a, a warning system like, uh, yeah, we have some equation uh, without going into details, but you know that normally a factor of safety is one, over one it's stable, uh, below one is a uh, critical situation, and uh, we with time we can calculate this uh, for each day, for each hour, whatever, uh, with this uh, uh, numerical codes. But this uh, code is really 
complex. Eh? Uh, modeling uh, unsaturated soil is very complex and uh, also time consuming. So we need, if you go to regional scale, we need simplifications. Eh? This is uh, sure, we have to separate clearly uh, the, this uh, scale analysis eh? that we have different scales. OK, so if we now go to regional scale, we have a newly developed uh, uh, shallow landslide uh, assessment model, F-SLAM. Uh, F is for fast. We wanted also to do something fast, so we had to simplify. But we can uh, apply it to large areas, uh, hundreds of kilometers and uh, hundreds of square kilometers, and we can compute uh, for a pixel size of five meter, for example, in a few minutes. Eh? And uh, yeah, the, this I want to show you a little bit now. Uh, we have also this uh, plugin. We uh, this is an open code. Uh, you can uh, go to GitHub uh, to download the code. Also the plugin. We uh, we developed a plugin for GIS. This is also an, an open GIS. And uh, yeah, it's to to make it easy for you to uh, to play around and uh, check these this models. So what is the base of this uh, physically based uh, uh, shallow landslide uh, model? We have a simplified hydrological uh, model. Uh, this uh, the infiltration of rainfall into the soil. Uh, as we, as I saw, uh, I said before, we have to simplify. Huh? We have uh, two approaches: the vertical flow approach and the lateral flow approach that we uh, calculate in a physical way, uh, simplified, but uh, in a physical way because, uh, yeah, we want to also have this uh, uh, input as rainfall that we can uh, make uh, for future prediction. For example, we have uh, this. Uh, not data driven or or uh, artificial intelligence uh, models. This is a physically based model that was one of our requirement. So we have at the end five uh, input rasters, uh, typical the dam first, uh, then we have the, the properties from the soil, and then we have also the land use and land cover, uh, the vegetation. Okay, and then we have uh, two rainfall rasters that uh, give us the the, the rail, rainfall condi uh, conditions. With all that, we calculate not a factor of safety. We have a stochastic uh, approach uh, because normally in the input parameter, especially for the soil properties, we have we have uncertainties, and so we calculate at the end a probability of failure. Uh, and this will be now a typical map of probability of failure from one, zero to one uh, in this area. OK, so uh, this was a bit theory. Uh, let's apply it to wide run. In wide run, uh, 10 years ago, we, we had uh, an exceptional catastrophic uh, flood and landslide epi uh, episode. Uh, you can see some, uh, uh, some pictures of the, the, uh, the bank erosion at the river, destruction of bridges, and uh, the accumulation of sediment uh, in uh, in urban area, huh? uh, losses exceeded 100 billion of euros. Huh? We are in my run here or to remember that here are the Pyrenees. We are in Catalonia, Spain on the north. So we are in this part in the central Pyrenees. OK, so what occurred that we focus more uh, on landslides, uh, but uh, at the end it's yeah, uh, it's a combination uh, of la shallow landslides, debris flows, and as you can see here, this uh, debris flows or hill slope debris flows transformed uh, into yeah uh, perhaps hyper concentrated flows debris flows and uh, delivered sediment to the uh, the drainage network. Eh? So we had this cascading effects that uh, that uh, increase that increased the damage uh, downstream. Okay. Once again, uh, without of uh, data, in this case uh, inventory, uh, we had uh, field surveys, uh, aerial pictures that we analyzed, and we had this uh, inventory of landslide initiation points, so more or less 400. Huh? You can see here the distribution of the points. Here we are in the main valley, 
Vieja is the, the capital of uh, Vaidran area. And uh, yeah, uh, this was uh, our study area for uh, applying uh, our, uh, our FSLAM model. OK. Uh, only one thing to under that to stress that uh, data analysis and good data is important. Eh? The, we we saw that the effect of the vegetation was was really important. Eh? In, the, in this, that plot, uh, perhaps it's a bit difficult, but here at the end, at the, the secondary uh, vertical axis, this is the density of the landslides. Eh? We have landslides points per square kilometer, and we have this for different vegetation types classes. Okay, in in grass and meadow. We have uh, two landslides per square kilometer. Eh? Then when shrubs in the red triangle, eh? I look to the red tri triangle. First, we have two uh, in uh, grassland. We go down for uh, shrubs. Open forest, we have uh, a bit more than one. And for dense forest, uh, we have uh, uh, less than 0.5. So we have this clear effect of the vegetation. Eh? And this was one reason that uh, uh, we had to include uh, uh, the effect of the vegetation, uh, especially for the root cohesion we saw, and also for the curve number for this hydrological model for uh, that we used uh, in FSLAM. We had to include that, and uh, this, uh, yeah, you can see in these two inputs, uh, especially with the land use and land cover, uh, this is a raster that we use. Huh? So once again. Uh, we need data, we need good data, we need good data analysis before uh, creating and uh, developing a model huh, that is at the end uh, 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 correct model. So then we applied uh, our model with all the inputs to the two 2013 uh, episode. This is the resulting uh, probability of failure map. Uh, in red we have high probability. And in blue, we have low probability. We did the typical rock analysis, and uh, yeah, uh, we were quite happy with the results. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, always a lot of uncertainties, especially in the soil properties, uh, etc. But this was our uh, calibration case to calibrate the, the, the data. What we did uh, in the next, we wanted to uh, also to check what hap will happen in the future. Eh? We checked uh, the impacts of future changes. On one side, the, the rainfall can change. We made it simplified. Eh? We, we could do it uh, much more sophisticated, but we, we checked on one side the, the future rainfall condition and on the other side, the, the future uh, Land use and land cover, eh? as we saw, the vegetation is important eh? for the for the landslides. These are now the, the the maps that we calculated. As I told you, that we have this FSLAM fast model, uh, so we had uh, the, the possibility that we, we had the possibility that we could uh, calculate really uh, a lot of scenarios eh? for future changes. Uh, these are only one example. Then we calculate the, the, the difference to the, the reference scenario, the present uh, condition. Eh? And the results were that if we look to the rainfall changes, we have an overall, we, we speak always uh, about an overall uh, 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 analysis. Eh? We have an overall decrease of st stability because we have higher rainfalls. Eh? We have more extreme events. And our uh, analysis of the, the, the climate models uh, show that we have uh, higher uh, rainfall, so we have uh, uh, more critical conditions uh, in the area. But on the other side, we have uh, an increase of stability. We have better condition uh, uh, with the land use changes. In the future, we will have more forest. Uh, this is especially uh, in the Pyrenees. We have since the last century, we have abandonment of agriculture. Eh? Nobody wants to work in agriculture. What before uh, 100 years or 50 years ago was uh, grassland or pastures. Now there are shrubs and, uh, and forests, and this will continue. So we have large areas of forest, and uh, consequently, we have higher cohesion, less uh, infiltration of the rainfall, and yeah, uh, an increase of stability. 
this was quite uh, interesting and the final results even was yeah uh, quite uh, surprising because we saw that uh, comparing the effect the individual effect of the land use and land cover this is a simplified chart the trend of stability more stable in this way uh, in the, the lower part more unstable but we uh, we could see that the land use and land cover uh, impact was much higher uh, the stabilization effect was much higher than the, the decrease of stability due to the future rainfall and so we we could see that uh, at least in our modeling in our study area uh, this is a high mountain area in the Pyrenees uh, where the, the especially land use and land cover uh, will in the future once again or continue to change we have an overall increase of stability in the future so this was quite surprising because everybody says um, or said or many people say that uh, in the future we will have more landslides but uh, yeah only looking to the climate then perhaps yeah we can say it yes but uh, we have uh, also this uh, this other uh, future changes and, la and land cover and and especially vegetation that will uh, uh, impact the, the the final results Okay, this was a bit uh, uh, going away from the, the modeling part, but this was quite uh, important results. And only with our fast model, we could calculate all this, this simulation for these future scenarios. So now we know where we have slope failures and also when they can occur. Yeah, but we have seen here in, uh, in other picture, uh, pictures also that we have the, the, the effect of the, the run out. Eh? We have this uh, run out must be included to get this uh, aspect of the cascading effects because all the sediment of the landslides, or not all, but uh, many landslides transformed into flows and uh, 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 increased the sediment in the, in the, the river network. Eh? So how we can now calculate uh, this uh, run out aspect of the landslides. Eh? We have different tools here at UPC. Uh, we have sophisticated, more local scale tool. The, this tool is uh, called flat model. It's a finite uh, volume code for torrential flows, landslides, and also snow avalanches. Uh, we have different uh, rheologies or flow re uh, resistance laws. And we can also include the, entrain, the incorporation of volume uh, during the runout. On the other side, we have nowadays uh, the geotechnical engineers uh, work a lot with material point method. And uh, yeah, we are in a consortium uh, that's, called, that's uh, uh, developing this ANORA, ANORA 3D code uh, uh, for this geotechnical application. I show. Uh, this example, once again, from uh, Vaidran, this occurred five years later. Eh? Uh, we go back to the Central Pyrenees. This is a really uh, uh, impressive uh, low like landslides. Eh? We can see here the, the picture from uh, in the, here is the, the map, uh, the overview map. We have this uh, the failure zone and then was the, the, the run out and accumulation in this uh, area of the, the river. Uh, there was even a, a, a bit of a natural dam. L they were very lucky because downstream there was a, a village, a quite important village, and the, there was uh, only a very small dam. Uh, but this would be now a typical uh, cascading effect that uh, the landslide blocked this river where the, the river uh, can yeah, build a, a water dam and we can have an, a dam break. Eh? Uh, without going into details, more detail about this cascading, but we did this uh, numerical modeling with this uh, material point method, very sophisticated, uh, uh, very sophisticated, once again, very time consuming. Uh, this needs uh, several several hours or even a few days to to make this calculation in 2d eh? if you want to make it 3d then it even will be uh, much more complicated on the other side we have the, the model uh, flat model this is a uh, this finite uh, 
uh, volume code that we use for debris flows. Here is an example for a back analysis of debris flows uh, with the flow depths is indicated here. We have some monitoring data in this uh, catchment that we can uh, uh, check the results. And uh, yeah, this is a bit uh, faster, but still, uh, yeah, uh, this is principally uh, used for local scale. Huh? Uh, very time consuming are these uh, simulations. And yeah, as I told, this is principally for local scale assessment. Huh? This is, uh, yeah, we have to include this uh, rheological parameter. We have the entrainment and yeah, this uh, slow down the, the calculation. Okay, to make it simpler, I don't know what, what is the time. I'm, yeah, okay. To make it simple, we, we have to simplify the, the, the modeling approach. We have uh, some uh, random walk flow routing uh, algorithm uh, using Monte Carlo. And uh, yeah, the only input here is a digital elevation model. And uh, we have different. Uh, numbers of of iteration the results will be a probability of fail uh, probability of uh, that uh, the, that the flow will pass through a pixel that we have here in this example red will be high probability that uh, the, the flow will pass through the pixel and uh, uh, yellow will be a lower probability we can also uh, calculate velocities this is again in our GitHub, if somebody's interested to download it. This is simplified. And uh, this we, we did now in MyDRUN eh? with the, 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 the base uh, rusted would be the, the probability of failure, the output. And uh, from uh, the high probability pixels, we calculated then uh, the runout. And we have here this. Uh, more reddish color will be, or orange color will be, high probability uh, uh, of uh, of the flow will be uh, passing this this uh, location. Here to uh, make a zoom in it, we have uh, once again five per five millimeter. Huh? It's quite uh, detailed for this regional scale. We speak about hundreds of uh, square kilometer, and this was one uh, flow that. Uh, was observed. This dashed uh, area was the the the, the flow uh, that uh, the inundated area of the flow, and uh, more or less it fits with the the area that uh, that we calculated with uh, the, this reddish color. Okay. If I at at the end, I don't know if I have time, uh, Bastian. If not, <laughs> uh, I will go. First, uh, through the, the presentation, I have a short demo. If we have at, uh, at the end time, we, uh, we can come back to this, uh, uh, this uh, information about uh, uh, this run out and uh, the, the stability calculation. OK, only to finish, we have also uh, rockfall models. Uh, once again, local scale. Uh, we also apply it a bit to larger scale, but uh, yeah. Uh, this is a 3D uh, rockfall propagation model. Uh, we specially designed it for the fragmentation of rockfalls. If somebody is interested in that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you can contact me or Nieves Lantara, who is also working uh, in our consortium. So uh, yeah, this is typical rockfall, quite uh, classic. The, the the novel thing in our uh, in our model is that we have this uh, incorporation of the fragmentation that is quite important uh, as you can see in this uh, lower right uh, photo that we have this effect of the fragmentation okay this we can use for risk as analysis uh, assessment of uh, protection measures here we have this area we have here a road and we have different uh, protection barriers that uh, we can calculate the, the blocks that pass with or without uh, these pantallas, the, the, the barriers, and we can make this, uh, this analysis uh, uh, quite uh, in a detailed way. Okay, but this was Rockfall. This is not uh, uh, the principal topic uh, for today. I will focus more on landslides, uh, rainfall-induced landslides, and uh, floods. Okay, so, uh 
we have seen now our models. We, apart from modeling, we want also to make some mitigation. And for mitigation, we can put some active mitigation measures, as you know. We can put some uh, uh, protection measures, uh, stop the, the flows, or we can have passive mitigation measures that uh, I will present you now. That uh, in that ca in our case will be this warning system that are tools to anticipate the, the events, uh, improve the coordination of emergency actions, and raise self preparedness. Huh? As as uh, we will see yeah, now in a moment. Okay, so now we will jump to the warning systems. Okay, and I will present you the the system that we are uh, developing in uh, Catalonia about landslides and debris flows. Yeah, now we speak about 30,000 square kilometers or more, huh? a, a large area. So we have uh, really simplify our approach. We are not able to make an infiltration modeling. Uh, uh, we use normally rainfall thresholds, uh, warning matrix, etc. OK, the general methodology of this uh, warning system is on one side we have the susceptibility map eh? without going into detail how we uh, determine it. Uh, we have here the, the susceptibility map in four classes from very low to high. Eh? And this is the, our static input. Eh? This we do not change. On the other side, we have the dynamic input, eh? the rainfall. This we com uh, here we combine radar and the, uh, the rain gauge that we have. Okay, with that we and our threshold criteria, we have our rainfall hazard le level on one side. And then we have the susceptibility uh, level on the other side from the susceptibility map, and then we have this warning matrix once again in four uh, classes in four levels, four colors like always, and then we have this warning map that we update every 30 minutes uh, with the, the present uh, rainfall uh, conditions. How it looks? It looks like that, uh, that we can see here on the left, we have the rainfall input. Eh? And then uh, this is an example for the Gloria storm 2020. Uh, we have an update every 30 minutes. Here we have this warning uh, levels. Uh, we normally visualize this warning level at sub basin scale huh? because we ca we calculate at 30 meter pixel for entire Catalonia. But uh, to make it easier to visualize, we we transform this for a sub basin scale, huh? especially for the administration. We are now in the testing phase uh, with the geological survey. Uh, we have our prototype and uh, we are testing now this uh, with the administration to have a look how it uh, how it works. This perhaps I can switch a moment. This will be now the platform. I switch now to the platform. Uh, in Catalonia, you know, uh, we have big problems with it because we don't have rain. So I had to go back uh, to 2020 to have an, an episode with rain. Uh, this is now the, the visualization tool that uh, that we have. Uh, we can uh, hear hourly. It's in Catalan. Uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, the Catalan administration. But you, you uh, here you can see the the, the rainfall uh, for this past event. Eh? It's not the present situation. It would be nice to have this rain now. But uh, yeah, uh, we have here uh, every hour the rainfall. Huh? Okay. We, uh, I make it now with uh, more transport, and then we have now the the warning in the the basins, huh? the sub basins. Okay. We, if you go uh, in more details, we could go go also for this 30, 30 meters. This is the thirty meters huh? plots. Okay. So we can visualize everything in this uh, V and administration. We can also go to uh, one point and then uh, make a click and to have a look what is the evolution of the rainfall and uh, the, the warning levels uh, at each moment. OK, so we are testing now this uh, uh, visualization, visualization tool and we hope that yeah, uh, rainfall will come back and uh, we will 
we will have some landslides event to to test it. OK, this is the the Catalan uh, prototype of this landslide and debris flow uh, warning system. And now I want uh, to switch or to go to my last part. Uh, Speaking about uh, flash flood, eh? we, we are happy that uh, in our group we have uh, experts in uh, hydrometeorological uh, analysis. This uh, is Mark Berenguer and Daniel Sempere Torres from CRAI Research uh, Center. And uh, yeah, they were also the coordinator of different uh, European projects. The last one was Anywhere project. And uh, yeah, they developed quite a lot of tools, uh, not only in that project, in previous projects uh, and other projects about flash floods, uh, uh, warning and impact assessment. So uh, this now is uh, available in the, the, the FAS uh, uh, website and the European uh, platform. And uh, yeah, one product is this uh, Erika, the European radar based precipitation monitoring now casting for flash floods. Eh? So they have, uh, again, they work with uh, the rain, uh, the radar uh, rainfall and the, the rain gauges eh, on one side. Even they have not only real time, eh, but, uh, what we have seen until now, I have forgotten to say that uh, this is mostly real time. Eh? that uh, the radar gives the data and we calculate it. Eh? But one thing is always, yeah, we need uh, to now cost, or they call it now cost, uh, we can say it also forecast uh, for several hours eh? uh, to make a, a prediction eh? uh, what will occur in the, in the next hours. So with this uh, prediction uh, and uh, uh, the inputs, they make the, the rainfall accumulation, calculation, and then they have the, the intensity duration threshold to have at the end this, they call it flash flood indicators. But uh, yeah, at the end of uh, levels, hazard levels uh, uh, in that uh, three colors. OK, this was the detail, uh, perhaps the, the, the workflow, the simplified workflow that we use in, uh, in Catalonia. We have the high resolution rainfall observation and now cast, yeah? the same that we use for the landslides. Uh, you can see here one screenshot. Then we have the, the hazard module with the, the rainfall thresholds. And in Catalonia, we use this return period uh, exceedance yeah? to indicate in each river uh, reach uh, what is the, the the, the expected return period of the, the, flood that, the flash flood that will occur. OK, so once again, a nice uh, animation from uh, my friends for, from CRAI. So this is now how it looks on the left. Once again, you have the, the, the rainfall input on the right. We have here now in, uh, in the same time uh, loop, we have uh, the, the return periods for each reach of the, the river eh? and this is a small uh, or this is a catchment uh, uh, in the center of Catalonia and uh, here is located Agramont that uh, we will see in a few minutes again. So this is really a fantastic tool that uh, yeah you can see here uh, working uh, in Catalonian uh, scale but this is working now at European scale. Eh? European scale they gave me, Kai gave me this nice, really impressive animation of the the whole Europe uh, uh, with the rainfall uh, assemble. You can see here even now it switched to forecast. Eh? They also check uh, always what is real time uh, uh, observation and what is uh, forecast. Uh, this is uh, the rainfall accumulation. Uh, in in uh, in May 2016. Eh? Then until now it uh, was observed, and then now we switch to forecast. Eh? This is really brilliant uh, work that uh, is European wide uh, available. And go to zoom a little bit. Yeah, this was until now was only the rainfall, but the same. You if you go zoom in like here, 
we have the rainfall on one side, eh? the, in the legend you can see the accumulation of the rainfall, and then you have this, once again, in each uh, river section, you have this hazard level. Eh? This is uh, now uh, this Erika uh, uh, project that uh, is uh, available in the EFAS uh, 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 yeah, platform of the website. Okay. So this was flash flood. The more uh, warning and hazard uh, indicator, but now we want to look also to the impact. Eh? We have seen now, until now, this was uh, yeah uh, the hazard indicator or the return period uh, in the, the river section, but we have to combine it now with. Uh, with uh, uh, exposure. Huh? So we uh, used uh, the results of Erika, make a new module with the flood maps. The, uh, there are the existing flood maps for each return period. And uh, so we can determine the extension of the, uh, of the, the flow of the flood, uh, the flood depths even. And then if we combine this with uh, exposure and vulnerability, we have this uh, impact-based warning. Huh? We have uh, population, economic loss, and uh, even critical infrastructure. Huh? This uh, yeah, uh, is uh, nowadays also uh, available. Uh, the CRI the group uh, uh, published uh, recently also uh, some some example on, on that uh, uh, on that tool. This was used uh, or was checked with uh, this uh, tragedy that uh, occurred in uh, in the central uh, of Catalonia. In once again we go back to Agramont, this uh, uh, catchment that we have seen. Uh, uh, some minutes ago, there was a, a flash flood, and in an elderly house, there uh, were five casualties because, uh, yeah, uh, the response time was uh, too long, and uh, other uh, uh, factor that, uh, yeah, caused at the end uh, these five uh, deaths. So, uh, yeah, in the future, we would, we could use. Uh, uh, with this now cost for uh, this uh, several hours uh, to predict uh, what will happen uh, uh, for uh, several years, uh, several hours uh, in the future, we can predict the flooded area. Here will be this elderly house in this uh, in this tragedy that I mentioned. Uh, we could also use this for uh, uh, population uh, analysis uh, for the the flooding uh, flooded area to make some. Uh, yeah, uh, estimates of the persons uh, uh, in danger. And uh, also we can make a calculation of the economic costs. Huh? There were some uh, case studies that uh, were done with uh, with some uh, uh, real real data. And yeah, uh, the first results are quite promising. So with all that, uh, let's finish with the, the outcome. Uh, we want to uh, try to uh, use all our tools, our knowledge, to make this multi-hazard uh, focusing, focusing on these uh, hydrogeomorphological processes, landslides, debris flows, and uh, flash floods or floods. Eh? All that starts with precipitation. We need the rainfall. Eh? Then we have the, the three main processes. Eh? That can have some yeah, cascading uh, 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 effects, uh, and we want to try to include, uh, especially with these tools that we have, the existing tools, uh, calculate uh, the increase in sediment from the landslides, from the debris flows. Uh, we want also to include uh, the, uh, the aspect of wood that is quite critical in uh, in flash floods also, and with all that. We want to combine that uh, the tools with the, what we have seen just before, with the, the exposure or the consequences. Eh? This impact based. Uh, we have different, uh, yeah, roads, uh, population, uh, power outage, uh, etc. That uh, we want to to uh, 
check with uh, with this new multi hazard warning that uh, we develop now uh, and in the in the future. Okay, so this is a bit uh, the outlook, and uh, uh, now this was from my part. Bastian, I don't know if what is the time. Yeah, more or less. I I promised with what uh, uh, half an hour, a bit more. Uh, I don't know if we want the first round of questions, but uh, or, or if there are short questions, or we have at the end a, a question round. Uh, Bastian, how many how many minutes? How long you have calculated more or less? Um, whatever's left, I'll fill. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, no, um, okay, so what do you do normally? Questions at the end? Questions midway and then at the end? Um, yeah, well, you can say if people have uh, questions now, please ask them now. And then, of, of, of course, also at the end, we have another option. Yeah. Yeah. We can make short questions now and then uh, perhaps uh, more discussion <laughs> at the end. Yeah, if there are any questions. <laughs> I see a question. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering yeah, if yeah. could you also include wildfires and the probability of higher wildfire occurrence in the Pyrenees into this first model you showed? Because you said at the moment it seems like with the future it gets more stable because more forest. But on the other hand, you could argue, well, more forest would might lead to more wildfires because it's very dry forest if there is no rain at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Really good question. Uh, especially nowadays, we have uh, this year we started uh, wildfire season <laughs> even in in March uh, in in Spain. So yeah, uh, our our job is especially to improve this land use and land cover uh, predictions. Uh, we used uh, a commercial one, but we would like to use a more sophisticated that uh, could, what you said, uh, also include uh, a wildfire aspect. This will sure uh, affect the future uh, yeah, land use and land cover maps that, uh, that we will, will have to use. How I still don't know how it will affect. Yeah, but sure it will be. Uh, yeah, less forest than uh, more uh, more landslide, more flash floods, etc. Sure, this is quite clear. Yeah, Amir. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for such a nice and uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question that uh, regarding the prediction uh, of land use. So, uh, uh, does it uh, within the model? Uh, uh, we yeah, as I told, we we used uh, the 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 easy model, uh, the TerraSet. That a modeler. It's a commercial one. Uh, uh, we have some uh, some doubts. Uh, it's more uh, we fit it with historical data, and uh, yeah. there are some uh, variables. And uh, yeah, the, the the prediction was more or less a continuation of what was occurring in the last uh, 20, 30 years. So this makes sense, but uh, there's still. Uh, things that we have to improve with the with that model huh? yeah if, okay. uh, yeah thank you and one last uh, short question uh i may, may you know uh, we uh, use these uh, the tools which you uh, just showed us in uh, any part of the world like you know in my case if i use it for pakistan yeah uh, sure the, the most of the models you can uh, you can use it at least ours our models are most in github you need data once again uh, without of yeah. data you cannot calibrate and uh, yeah and the last ones the last the, the tools that i show you that they need uh, uh, 
radar rainfall, but if yeah. you don't have radar rainfall, you can use the same methodology and use uh, rain gauges or satellite uh, precipitation data, whatever. The, the methodology is there. Okay, okay. thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Sonis. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, Bastian, now you have to fill. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, Thank sorry, yeah, part. but we have still. Um, it seems we should talk more because I'm going to present some similar topics actually and some similar, uh, uh, well, similar problems or trying to find solutions. Let me share my screen. Um, this one I'm looking for. So, what I'll do uh, is um, I'll talk first about uh, multi hazard modeling and the impact on Dominicav, this multi hazard. Events, and then I'll have a look at this new model called Fast Flood that we've been working on a lot in recent years. Um, let me go ahead and yeah, can you see the present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. now it's screen? perfect. Yeah, now it's oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, we only has that modeling. Yeah, so so we're we're also looking a lot into this process, um, and we're. Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think to, to provide some context at the start, a lot of these processes are driven by the basic cycles uh, in, in your system, right? The hydrological cycle driven by solar energy and the extremes in this cycle tend to be the hazards that we want to know more about, uh, the events that are hazardous for us. Extremes in precipitation, extremes in surface flow, uh, which are normal processes in the cycle, but the extremes are the ones that we are interested in. And the same for the rock cycle. We're interested in the extremes of erosion, the extremes of movement uh, of tectonic plates, the extremes of, well, you get it. And that those extremes become the landslides, the earthquakes, etc. So let's have a, a, sh a short example of a, of a study case, one that, that we've worked on a lot. Um, so in 2017, there was a Category 5 hurricane called Maria, uh, which made landfall late in the evening. And what you see here is a mosaic of two radar um, images for this area. And yeah, it, it hits the south of the island and then it stalls also for a little bit, which led to insane amounts of precipitation. You're talking for the entire island more than 600 millimeters within 24 hours. So in such a situation, if we if we look at that in a schematic way, you see, okay, the rivers, they're going to flood, right? With that amount of water, anything that's going to viably have any flooding is going to have flooding. But we also see storm surging along the coastline. We see slope instability because of oversaturation of the soils. We see runout from these slope instabilities. And in fact, we see all of them happen at the same time. And a lot of interactions start to occur. Um, that's better. <laughs> so um, interactions you can think about the dilution of debris flows and landslide material, which causes further runouts, the blocking of channels by tree debris or by uh, sediment from the, uh, the debris flows, backwater effects, storm surging and flooding interacting, causing for more flood depth in the cities along the coastline, etc., etc. This is what the same catchment looked like after two of these kind of events, uh, Tropical Storm Erica and uh, Hurricane Maria. Uh, this is the same village called Petit Sauvant. And you see the devastation, right? Landslides all over, um, run out everywhere, uh, flash flooding in all of the streams, and it all merges into a very messy, multi-hazard type of process uh, event with a lot of uh, uh, cascading effects, blocking of rivers, impact from, from rocks and debris on houses, uh, the blocked rivers then flood into second parts of, of towns, etc., etc. The sediment in the floodwaters also causes a lot of damage uh, and, and a financial impact to the residents as well. Also, the, the vegetation uh, component that was also just mentioned. You see a lot of the vegetation is, is destroyed in the area uh, and, and also dragged along with the flow, blocking also the bridges. Um, that's case there on the picture uh, on, on top of the bridge, which is also a hazard for our scientists. Uh, uh, <laughs> so when we hit all that stuff, yeah, OK, our, our wheels broke and we had to fix fix the car. Even for the vegetation itself, the wind is an important uh, uh, factor of damage. On the left, you see an image just after Hurricane Maria, 
and you see that basically all the vegetation is 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 doomed, right? So all of the leaves have been blown off. People reported to us that yeah, in their houses the wind is 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 so incredibly strong that they see the grass sort of being shot through the the cracks in uh, in in the wooden doors. Um, and then after two years, you see a lot of it has regrown, but that's not actually leaves from the trees, but that's invasive species, vines, uh, creeper plants that go up to the canopies to fight for the sunlight. So all these hazards, you can categorize them a little bit in terms of where do they occur. Um, we have here a deep subsurface, top left, surface on the top right, atmospheric on the bottom right, and then space on the top uh, bottom left. And then all of these hazards occur in these different uh, areas of the Earth system. Now the bottom left, the space ones, if we have a meteor impact, consider all of them active. Um, so we're not looking at that so much. But uh, for example, if we look at uh, interactions between these, uh, you can see, for example, that hurricanes on the bottom right have a lot of interactions to the surface processes. Storm surging, flooding, debris flows, shallow landslides, but then also shallow landslides can cause more flooding, like what we just saw. Um, the, the, the blocking of rivers can result in, in more flooding. Um, so there's many, many of these interactions between the erosion and, and et cetera. And then also from the deep subsurface, we see things like ground shaking from earthquakes, of course, having a lot of impact on surface processes as well through landslides, uh, ground shaking, et cetera. Now we try to model with a tool we make, we try to model uh, the hydrometeorological surface hazards um, in an integrated manner. So we also try to look at those interactions, uh, which is, is, yeah, there's a lot of open questions still there. We try to input some of the other hazards as boundary conditions, as far as that is possible. I'll, um, maybe in the future we end up where we can actually do more integrated modeling anyway for all of these, uh, these zones, but well, okay. For now, physically based modeling is such a multi hazard context, specifically Dominica. What can we do there? Well, one thing to keep in mind that was already mentioned um, physically based modeling, we did try to do the laws of physics and solve them numerically on the computer to try to predict the dynamics and the behavior of these hazards. However, physically based modeling is only as good as your input. So, bad input data means bad output. And your assumptions can also often be the limiting factor in accuracy. The, I'm going to skip all the examples of, of because of time, but um, this is basically what we integrate into model in terms of, uh, of theory. I'll give you a short overview of how everything works. Put in my charger. Yes. Um, so we start with, with infiltration and a common model that is used also by us is the green and amped infiltration model, where you try to predict physically based the movement of water into the soil using a wetting front, uh, which is, well, it does typically match the behavior in real life, but it is, yeah, it is a sort of, uh, there's definitely an assumption there, right? In reality, there's much more variation in the vertical uh, water profile in soils. So this is something we do to make things um, solvable at a regional scale uh, and at the scale at which these hazard processes occur. But each of these assumptions, like I mentioned, is going to limit the accuracy and applicability of your model as well. And the resulting behavior is what you expect from nature. In the start, we have a lot of infiltration, but as long as the event goes on, you see that the soil saturates and you get less and less infiltration in the end. Now, the important information here is soil information, right? We need to know spatially what is happening to the soil and even land cover has a big impact on that, uh, on the porosity of the soil. So how much water can fit in the soil, but also how fast does the water infiltrate into it? And that determines also how much runoff is going to uh, be generated, but also how much water is going to be added to the groundwater. We try to model evaporation and transpiration, uh, so solar energy that causes the uh, phase transition of water, which is very clearly visible in satellite imagery. Satellite imagery being incredible help in any case, by the way, for uh, input data, because a lot of the parameters that you need for this kind of modeling can be obtained, although with relatively poor quality, but they can be obtained from satellite imagery, including vegetation presence. Now there's some tricky things you always have to keep in in, in the back of your mind, um, how the presence of vegetation 
the links to event inspiration is not a linear process. So there's always empirical relationships you have to use to correct for these things. There are things that you cannot physically base the model at a detailed scale, not when you do regional hazard simulations. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this uh, also for time. Um, in the end, we, okay, either um, the water infiltrates and we start talking about soil process. So then, okay, let's look at, uh, at these soil profiles. We have a certain soil depth, a wetting front, we have a groundwater table and some bedrock at the bottom. And then based on the forces that are acting on that, uh, the weight, the shear force, and the normal force, so we can actually try to estimate the stability. Now, a lot of that, as was mentioned before, depends also on visiting uh, these landslides and actually looking at what is what is happening in the soil. So these are four sites uh, examples, uh, also in Dominica, where you can see the, the failure surfaces, the depth, and also the soil profile there. Oh, where is it? There we go. So for the, the stability, we use Morcolom's law uh, to describe also the resisting force that is available. Uh, and if you predict that the forces that are driving the soil downwards are going to exceed it, in principle, you're predicting failure. Now, there's a lot of other influences here, um, uh, cementing for different uh, grains, uh, types of minerals, uh, cohesion by clay, uh, organic matter, but also the roots, for example. Uh, and moisture content. Things that are detailed to map spatially, but yeah, when you try to take them into account, this can help. Now, the infinite slope model is is something that we do use from time to time. It's it's fast, efficient. Um, it doesn't work so well for for larger rotational slides, but for translation uh, translational movements, it can work very well. And for regional scale, it's a very good uh, type of model. We try to extend upon it by having an iterative uh, uh, solution to actually predict also the failure depth and not only the locations. So that allows us to link it dynamically also with runout. So we do physically based modeling of slope stability, but also then predict the runout based on the predicted volumes. We do some subsurface uh, force solutions to also capture the interactions between the different, uh, different soil columns on the slope. Um, finally, what is the core of most of these processes is the uh, the actual flow uh, solver, right? So we also try to use physically based tools to predict the behavior of the, the dynamical flow system. It could be either flooding, landslides, debris flows, uh, anything. And what we use there is uh, uh, um, what is called multi-phase equations. So two phase equations in particular. So we model the fluids and the solids separately and also their interactions in order to capture the behavior uh, of a system, but that can also change in its flow type. So you can imagine if you have landslides, which is uh, a lot of solids uh, in this flow, and it merges with a river by entering a stream, that the flow type is going to evolve dynamically. Uh, and also when, when, when they hit streams and they merge, it might dilute and become much more of a, a debris flow instead of a landslide movement. Now, um, I will, how much time do I have? Yeah, that's going to be tricky as well. So I'll give you the, I'll give you the summary of it. Typically for flood modeling, the, yeah, the equations that are the, the industry standard and they have been for a long time are what's called the St. Vanal equations. And uh, those are three equations in total. We have mass conservation and then a momentum balance. And what that basically says is, well, we don't actually have magic appearance and disappearance of water. What we have instead is uh, 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 that our water either moves somewhere, goes into the soil or it comes from precipitation, or it's stored at a location. And by using this sort of bookkeeping approach, what you can set up is a differential equation that describes the, uh, or basically, yeah, it has all these, these movements and storage of, uh, of water in it. And we can do the same for the momentum, which is also a conserved quantity. Now, what really matters is the forces that you also link with this. And for water, we would typically link the flow with gravity, pressure, uh, and, and frictional force. And when we talk about multi-phase flows, we also use the, uh, the internal friction angle um, and, and, and the sort of internal rheological stability that comes from the solids in the fluid. Then the viscosity, a drag force between the water and the solids, 
and as well as a, a diffusive uh, uh, behavior for finer particles. Now, as a result, you get um, these, these long equations with many force terms, but the beauty of these is that they're very dynamic, right? So they, they give you the forces and the interactions between the water and the solids, but they can automatically evolve based on what is happening, what is actually in your flow um, and the context of it. So we can model water and all the solids related terms will go to zero. We can do pure rock avalanches, but also anything that's in between and anything that evolves dynamically. Now erosion uh, from, from debris flows and landslides is, is a big component there as well. Um, I think I always feel there's a, there's a lot of research that needs to be done there. Uh, there's a lot of simplified approaches based on excess shear stress to try to predict the erosion, but it's a very explosive process and, and difficult to get right in, uh, in physically based modeling. Um, OK, so far a bit about the modeling modeling theory, about what we do, and this is all available in a tool license that I'll, I'll show you very shortly. Um, we apply this model to uh, to Dominica. 70,000 people, 90% uh, affected uh, by the hurricane, 65 uh, fatalities, and a damage that is uh, yeah one and a half times the, the GDP. Again, the uh, the trajectory of the of the hurricane moving over with just incredible amounts of rainfall falling on the island. Not to speak of, of uh, yeah, the wind speeds, of course, as well. Storm surging was rather minimal for the, this, yeah, the intensity of the event. And again, yeah, I showed you these images before, landslide impact as well as debris flows. It's going to get a short visualization of what it looks like after the event. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear this, but <laughs> what uh, the person that took the video is saying is that uh, his town, Kulubistri, was totally destroyed by the hurricane. You see a combination of wind damage, you see a combination of sediments uh, brought in by the flash flooding, but also by the landslides that feed the sediments to the flows. Um, and there's there's basically no house that's uh, that's left untouched. From aerial imagery, which we were uh, able to uh, to gather before and after the event, you can further see the impact, right? So completely eroded out uh, uh, channels. That depends a bit on location. Sometimes the landslides really fill up the channels, which is also not a good thing. And sometimes you have a lot of erosion, but well, I'll leave that for a later discussion. And what you can see as well is that uh, some of the houses are simply missing. They're just completely gone, especially in the north along the northern uh, stream. Uh, there's a, about five uh, houses that are just gone completely. Now we I focus here now a little bit on on Grand Bay. Uh, we did a lot of modeling for the entire island, but this uh, that's a little bit large to show in a, in a nice overview. Uh, Grand Bay area is in the south of the island, and there's two towns. The one you just saw is called Pichelin. And then there's uh, the Grand Bay, which is the larger village near the coastline. And all of the landslides were mapped, which is a very useful data set, of course, when you want to validate your model as well. Um, from the imagery, it was also clearly uh, doable to, to map all the flow processes in general, because everything was so sediment rich, you could see it very well uh, from the imagery. We were able to, uh, to get some information on soil depth and soil parameters uh, throughout this area as well which is very important uh, when you're talking about slope stability modeling and uh, well, as was mentioned before as well. And these are some of the results that you get. So what, what are we looking at here? So on the left, you see uh, an overview of the, of the modeling results for this area, and it's a two-dimensional color legend. The blue indicates the maximum water flow height for this area during the event. And then the more orange is there, means the higher solid content. So those are the landslides and the parts where the landslide material uh, ran out to, eventually reaching the coastline. On the right, you see uh, some zoomed in areas, and there you also see an overlay um, with the inventory, so the mapped extent of the flow processes. Now we were able to get, get quite detailed accuracy with the modeling. Um, I mean, we're talking about fairly small landslides compared to uh, uh, the model resolution, but still we were able to get a very good fit between the amount of events and the locations generally, 
compared to uh, uh, to the mapped uh, processes. One of the big benefits there was the uh, availability of high quality elevation data. I'll show you that in a little bit as well. And this is what it looks like when we show a 3D uh, overview a bit of the model results compared to what it looked like uh, from satellite imagery. Now, after the event, one of the things that uh, that we had to uh, uh, calculate, uh, we did for uh, for the government as well, was looking at uh, bridge design and also the clearing of some of the channels here. So a lot of them fill up with sediment, and that means you have much less channel capacity for the next event. So it's important that they clear those quite rapidly, so that for the next event you have enough flow capacity, not so that not all the towns along these channels actually flood as well. Now to show you a little bit of an example of the influence of data quality on your uh, model results, I'm showing you here on the left a simple flow simulation. This is not a multi-hazard simulation, it's just water flow. On the left using LiDAR elevation, uh, so originally uh, LiDAR based elevation at half meter resolution, but then resampled to 10 meters. And on the right, using SRTN, this is a global data set based on uh, radar satellites, and that's originally published at 30 meter resolution. And I, I, yeah, I think you can see the difference in quality, right? You get a much more generic sense of the flow processes of what happens. Um, yeah, so just like uh, in the first part of this session, the quality of your input data and for flow processes, your elevation model in particular, is very critical when it comes to the accuracy of your output. Um, what we did in the end was look also at the, the relationship a little bit between uh, return period and these multi-hazard interactions. And what was very strange, what we noticed was that um, typically you would in assume that for higher return periods of precipitation, your impact would be higher as well. What we noticed though, that was because of particular interactions like landslide damming um, and dilution of these debris flows, it was not so much the case here. Like in general, yes, uh, in our scenarios, the five year return period was the lowest uh, in terms of the amount of houses damaged. But it was not always the case. There were cases where actually the 50 year return period had a lower impact than the 10 year return period. So the general, the trends held, but then this multi hazard model. Uh, things became a lot more complex also when looking at the return period of precipitation and the return period of local impact. Um, I think I have time for this. It's it's a really interesting case study for multi hazard modeling, so I'm going to quickly talk about this one as well. We did a, a separate modeling in uh, China, in the Wenchuan area. There was a big earthquake there in 2008. Um, which caused a huge density of landslides uh, throughout this area. It was a 400 kilometer long fault line. And you can see that also on the bottom right. Uh, right? The density of landslides in the area was just immense. Um, and it was this area where we uh, where a particular cascading chain of, uh, uh, of events happened. So there's a town uh, along the main river uh, called Yingshu Town. And Yingshu Town is just opposite of uh, uh, Hongshun Gali. Now, in Hongshun Gali, you see there in red the landslides that uh, occurred after the earthquake. And there was one particularly big landslide, indicated L1, that caused a lot of deposition, 10 meters, 12 meters even, uh, which is indicated by this uh, this blue shape there. Now, what happened was that two years later, uh, a big flash flood event broke through and eroded a lot of that landslide dam material, and that ended up in the larger Min River, blocking the main river, and then causing flooding in the newly constructed part of Yingshu town, newly constructed to house the refugees from the earthquake that took place in 2008. So there was a really, uh, this is an image from the, the erosion uh, from the center of uh, Feng Shung, uh, catchment. So there was, a, was an interesting multi-stage cascading hazard chain. We had the earthquake in 2008, caused seismic landslides and their deposition. And then in 2010, there was a storm which caused flash flooding, erosion and then debris flow as a result of that. And finally, that deposited in the larger river, causing flooding in Yingshu town. So we try to model this as well. Um, we try to do the whole chain. So we go from co-seismic slope failures on the top left to deposition on the top right, comparing also with the inventory of the processes on the bottom left um, and the failure depth you see on the bottom right. 
So trying to physically base, do a prediction of each of these components of the model. We try to verify also with elevation model differences from uh, satellite uh, based elevation models corrected with ground control points. And then you see that in this major landslides, we could predict fairly well the elevation difference in terms of erosion uh, or sorry, uh, landslide location, so failure depth and also the deposition in the in the gully. And finally, the second stage, we also model the uh, flooding you see on the top right um, and the flash flooding in the catchment on the left, together with the erosion and the final deposition. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty in this kind of modeling. Uh, as we mentioned a lot before, the quality of your input means uh, a lot, uh, and also the assumptions are a limiting factor. So if you look at ensemble modeling, so running a lot of variations of your input data, we can also try to estimate the uncertainty in the output. And with this approach, we could just finally find that the uh, probability of flooding in this town for this kind of event was about 60% in our model. Well, you might be wondering, if you have to do all that work, calibrating, uh, validating, and then uh, uh, even doing yeah, many, many variations of this modeling, what is the point of such a detailed investigation? Well, one of the big purposes is alternative scenarios. So they actually carried out some post-event measures. Uh, the channel was widened at the outlet, and we could recalculate the, uh, the impact and see that it actually had worked. This was a sufficient mitigation uh, according to our modeling, at least. OK, so I have uh, 12 minutes left. I, <laughs> um, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. What we've talked about so far is a lot of, uh, at least what I talked about, is really detailed multi-hazard modeling. And yeah, I think as uh, Marcel also mentioned, that's something that's very labor intensive, slow. It depends a lot on the quality of the data. And it's not something that you can easily set up. Now, there's very useful tools to help you. Satellite data can do a huge amount. But there are limitations and it's just labor intensive. We've been working on a separate tool which is more meant um, for rapid uh, assessment and mitigation sketching and I wanted to shortly show you that as well. Uh, so I'll switch. I uploaded both presentations by the way to the, the repository where did you have for that. Um, but I've done. So this is new new tool called uh, Fast Flood, and well, so you've seen already that this physically based modeling is is critical. It has a risk assessment. Uh, it can do a lot of of really useful things, but the speed and the labor intensiveness is you is is often a limiting factor. Also, there's many types of models. Um, yeah, we're talking here about detailed physically based models, but there's also a lot of approximate models. But they all have have a lot of their limitations. So we started working on this new one and what came out was a really, really impressive method in the sense that you can get to 95, 97% accuracy in a fraction of the time. So for this same Grand Bay area in Dominica, talking about a one second simulation against a two hour simulation uh, for the full multi-hazard setup that I showed you earlier. <coughs> so which is which? Uh, this fast model and then the full slow model, traditional, fully physically based uh, uh, setup. Well, the point is that you can't tell and I can't tell either. I have to say, I believe the right one is the full modeling. Um, but in terms of impact, they behave very, very similarly. And that's the point. And even if you zoom in, um, yeah, here you notice because you can see the landslides also on the right one. <laughs> that's the full multi-hazard simulation where the landslides also are more clearly visible. Um, we actually published this tool as a free web-based uh, uh, model. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, in, in, in the last uh, time that I have a short demonstration of how it works. Now you can use this basically anywhere in the world. Um, if you go to fastflood.org, it's it's available. It's a, a free tool. And um, I'll just go to flash. You get a website link and a, and a tutorial. Uh, yeah, so you can you can have some more information there as well. And just as an example, let's say we want to uh, have a look at the same area, Grand Bay in the south of Dominica. Well, I'm going to select this area. Then I can go ahead and select the resolution and I can download automatically from global data sets the data that I need 
for my modeling. If I go ahead to the menu, I can specify my rainfall event. The default setting here is perfectly fine to characterize uh, this tropical cyclone behavior here. And that's it. We got our modeling results. We can play around with the rainfall event. Uh, let's say it's actually uh, a, a lot more and, and we can see immediately what happens to our events, right? Um, let's say we want to talk about mitigation and maybe uh, uh, somebody has plans to make a reservoir here. Well, let's see what's it actually going to do. Let's input a reservoir, set our reservoir height. Uh, maybe we have a, a 15 meter high design. Make sure in the settings to indicate that we want to account for that. And we can go ahead and see what that simulation actually does. In this case, not so much. And I think even if we make it into, uh, well, maybe even an absurd range, it's not going to do so much here. <laughs> maybe they have better luck here. Finish, let's see. Uh, yes. Yeah, even here, it's just too much water anyway, right? You can fill up the entire catchment with water and still it wouldn't do much. There's many, many better areas. For example, you can make a levee system here, which would much more, uh, 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 maybe a much cheaper solution to predict, uh, to protect that area. You see, this has much more clearly uh, an impact. Other things that you can uh, sketch out are things like draining channels. So you can actually paint elevation, elevation changes directly into your elevation model. So here I might go ahead and decrease the elevation of my channel bed. Run the model again. And see that we have changes to our blood depth in this area. Now, in this case, we're working also with global data sets because that's what allows this model to be uh, to be free and work everywhere. But you could also load your own uh, physically uh, your own input data. So let's say I have a, a higher quality elevation model. I can go ahead and load that as well. Run the same simulation and benefit from the increase in quality that I get from that. Now all of a sudden my reservoir is behaving much more nicely, I have to say. <laughs> So this is a, a web-based tool. It runs locally on your own machine, so there's no server. You don't have to worry about your data. Um, and it might be something that, uh, uh, that could be uh, useful. I want to give you one other example, because what we're looking here is a very small area with, uh, with flash flooding. But another type of approach that we also do here is uh, a more um, yeah, cascading type of model setup. Uh, so we just finished a, a project doing a flood assessment in Gabon. So if you take uh, that country, which is also, well, <laughs> not by accident, but which happens to coincide with the catchment of the main river in the country, the Ugué uh, River, we can go ahead and set up a 600 meter resolution model, which is very low resolution, of course, and specify an extreme event. Now, in this case, this uh, four millimeter per hour for 200 hours, uh, is a good characterization of such an event. It might seem like a low intensity of precipitation, but the reason is it's a very large area. So you have to think about how the rainfall averages for that big area. Um, if we uh, go ahead and, and, and look at our results, well, that, that's good, but yeah, we can't really zoom in here, right? So what do we do then? Well, what is built in into this uh, web-based tool is also uh, a way to have multiple model areas and link them together. So I'm going to make a second model area and I'm going to zoom in here to this area alongside the Ugué River. And I'm going to automatically download 20 meter resolution data for this area. And what we can do then is go ahead and say, well, let's do our physically best upscaling, use the input from the first simulation and feed that to this more detailed area uh, to predict also the flood extent here. And again, within a minute, we have set up a cascaded uh, flood uh, simulation uh, that predicts flood event. Again, I'm using here the global data sets, SRTM, which there's certain uh, uh, quality uh, uh, disclaimers I, sh I should give. But I, I hope the idea is clear, right? Some of this fast approximate technology can be uh, uh, critical in certain kinds of applications. I mean, if you want to design a bridge, 
you're not going to be using this. You shouldn't be using this, uh, I should rather say. But if you're at the start of your project and you want to discuss with stakeholders what viable solutions are, you can use something like this as a sketching tool. Or maybe you have an early warning system and um, you want to have also extent of the floods predicted. Well, you might use these kind of rapid models where full physically based models is, is just not possible. So there's a certain uh, use case. And we always say, yeah, there's, there's, there's very many models, uh, but you just have to find something that fits, that's, that's uh, fit for the purpose that you're using it for. And in this case, uh, linking these kind, kinds of models might fit the application that, uh, that they want. 